I was a broker before I started flipping houses, and then we started doing wholesales and flips, and Travis and I ended up doing, I don't know, somewhere in the vicinity of a thousand transactions over a seven or eight year period of time, which sounds like an insane amount now that I say it out loud, but, you know, when we started, it was like we did maybe four four deals the first year, 16 deals, and then we joined seven figure, and we got up to like 180 deals a year um, between wholesales and flips. And, you know, we were just getting smashed on taxes, living in New Jersey, paying 37% federal, and then paying state tax. We were giving half of our money to the federal government. And it was a very transactional business, as you know. So we were looking to figure out how do we turn our active income into passive income, and got around some guys like you saying, hey, you should read this book, Tax-Free Wealth, right, and learn about how to pay less in taxes and maybe look at some commercial property to get some passive income that way. And so we did. We decided to buy and build three self-storage facilities that we were actually partners in. And that year we paid no taxes. And I realized maybe we built the wrong widget or a widget that was a little less complimentary tax-wise than commercial real estate. So we got into that, and then we started raising capital for those particular projects. And we partnered with experienced operators, and we brought the capital in and started to realize that there's more than one way to make money in real estate than wholesales and flips, but also we could add this to our portfolio to really create some passive income and generational wealth. So fast forward to today, we've raised over $100 million in private equity. We have a separate $100 million equity fund currently that's about 35 percent subscribed in the last uh, six months or so. Uh, We're bringing in now about a million dollars a week in private money and have um, completed just about $350 million in commercial transactions. What would you say to somebody who's starting to raise money maybe for the first time, was like us back then, and, you know, is kind of like either been using, uh, you know, hard money or banks or things like that and doesn't realize that this is possible, whether it's for real estate or or any uh, business, like what would you say to them? Who's kind of the people that they should look for and what's some advice you would give? I remember the list conversation almost like it was yesterday when we started having it and it was, you know, people are looking for places to put their capital and you have the opportunities to present to them. And I think when we're first starting out, we're always like, I hate asking, right? Nobody likes to ask for money. But when you really believe that you have something of value to offer to investors, it's not really a sales process. So one, it's letting people know what you're doing, right? Being able to talk to them about the types of deals that you're doing, how people are can make money with you even if they haven't yet, and then letting them know how it's securitized, what the rates of return are. But, you know, w- one of the takeaways from our conversations when we started raising capital was, you know, just go get some, some people together that know, like, and trust you, take them out to lunch, ask them about what their investments are doing, Ask them what a reasonable rate of return would be if they were to fund maybe one of your deals. Because I used to go out and say, hey, I, I can offer you X, right? And it's not, it's not helpful necessarily to that person. You might be cutting off your nose to spite your face, frankly, because they might need a lower return than you would be willing to give out of the gate. So if you just sit down with people and ask a lot of questions, you know, what, is, what are they investing for? What is their purpose in, in their investment? You know, are they looking to remain liquid? Are they looking to just increase return on investment? So just going out and creating the rapport, giving people the opportunity to tell them what they're looking for, and then you matching something to their need. Not only do you have something of value, but you're accomplishing what they want to accomplish and accomplishing their goals. And then it becomes a much easier conversation, and you don't feel like you have to go tugging on people going, hey, I need money, right? Because I need money doesn't relate to an easy way to to get capital. But when you start to build a stable of people that you know that are looking to deploy capital into some maybe diversified assets, asking the right questions is super important. Now, one thing that I really love to do is just treat it like any other conversation. Basically, anything that I've ever sold is tell me about what you're doing right now. Right. Tell me about your goals. Tell me about your life. Tell me about you know why. Because they say all my money's in the stock market. And I, I, I will literally say, well, why don't you just keep it there? Yeah. And let them tell you why they don't want it there. And if they might actually say, well, I saw your post and you seem to hate the stock market, so I'm interested to know why. Right. And then I'll tell them my experience. <laughs> but at no point am I trying to convince them that my, you know, my deal is the best thing for them to put their money into, unless they've told me all of the reasons why 
like things that they're looking for that I can provide. And if I'm not the best fit, then I'll say, hey, you should probably just keep doing what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. You know? And when you come in with that kind of mentality, like I, I had dinner with uh, a woman last night here in Charleston, and we were talking about her business, uh, like, you know, just working with clients and trying to, and, and selling. And I, I was like, well, don't sell yourself. Don't sell your program. Don't sell what you're offering. Find out about them. The more you can find out about them, and some of their pain points, in just in a, a simple conversation, then you can then you can create the opportunity for them that makes the most sense. And maybe you only talk about three of the things that you're doing, because if somebody doesn't need tax savings and they can't use them, that's not what I'm going to talk about in a real estate deal. <laughs> right. You know, and if and if I don't have cash flow to give for this deal and they're looking for cash flow, I'm not going to tell them how great the cash flow is going to be because it's not. Yeah, in some cases, and I might have a different opportunity for them that way so sales um, gets a bad rap because salespeople come in they just tell you right they show up and throw up versus what real sales is is actually figuring out how to solve a pain point but if you don't ask a lot of questions to reveal that pain point then you can't sell them anything you can't tell them how your solution benefits them at all so walking slowly through the halls and building that relationship is key yeah and, and, and like you said a lot of times pe- uh, you know, people don't have time. They want to raise money really fast, yeah. and then you sound desperate, and people are really just going to say no. But well, we've been uh, doing this now for, I mean, like we said, almost $100 million in capital raised, and capital hates a fire drill. And the reason that it does is because they can kind of smell the desperation on you. And also, if it was that great of a deal, and I think this way now too as an investor, right? If it was that great of a deal, why are you coming to me in the last hour? And, you know, sometimes there is just a great opportunity in the last minute, but oftentimes the people that are ready to do that are guys like me and you because we can assess a deal. We have done enough deals where we know that we can pull the trigger really quickly. Your typical investor that has been in the stock market for the last 30 years is not going to write a check for $250,000 in the next seven days. Yep. And a lot of my, a lot of the money that I've raised has been over long periods of time of building trust, like you said and relationship, it's not, you know, get on a call and, okay, let me just send you a half million bucks. It's not easy. And everybody, you know, thinks, so first, it's a lower barrier to entry to enter the commercial real estate world than probably anything else because you have a network, you have relationships. That being said, it's also not easy, right, to be able to build that credibility and trust for people to write you a check with their hard-earned money and to trust you with it. I mean, it takes a lot of integrity, a lot of character, a lot of trust, and you need to be able to give them a very articul- well-articulated business plan on how they're going to get their money back. Forget about the return on investment, but how do I get my money back? Yep. And, you know, how are you going to preserve my capital and then give me my money back is the two things that we like to talk about. But it, it does have a lower barrier to entry to get involved in these deals now, but it's not easy. The key is, is like anything else, over time, it gets easier, right? Your credibility continues to grow. So there's a lot of work to be done in the beginning, but the longer you do it and the longer success that you have to show people your rates of return and to show people that you're giving them their money back and to show people how you deal with problems, the easier it is to get capital. Okay, so if I'm an investor that's just getting started that's watching this, um, like without a track record and credibility, what would you advise to me? Like who would I go to for money or like what would that look like? Because I think a lot of people are like, well, I have to do my first deal before I can or my first 10 deals or something before I can go raise money from any private uh, lender or anything like that? Yeah, I mean, think about it from two perspectives. One, you need to be able to tell the investor what types of deals you're looking to do. And so you also need to figure out where that deal flow is going to come from and whether that's a partnership or if you're just going to start on single-family rentals yourself or you know whatever the case. I think having an asset class defined so that the investor kind of knows what it is that you could do. But before that, you know, it, it's going out and talking to different investors that are looking to potentially deploy capital into real estate, right? Like, are they looking to diversify their, into different things? And then just taking them out to lunch or doing phone calls and, and just asking them, like, hey, what types of investments are you into now? If I were to bring a deal that was doing X, Y, and Z, would that be interesting to you? And I mean, again, you have to go through those qualifying questions in the beginning to figure out, you know, if somebody's never going to put money in real estate, like, don't waste your time. 
But if they're looking to diversify out of the market or maybe they're already in real estate and they're looking for other opportunities, and just letting them know, like, this is what I'm going to be doing, right? I'm going to be either bringing you deals that I'm going to be operating myself and I have this experience and this is why it's cool, or, you know, me and my partners, my partners and I will have these types of opportunities in the future, and I'm just trying to figure out who wants to be involved when they, they come up. It's just simple conversations like that, letting people know what you're doing. I think the book that you first turned me on to was Getting the Money, right? I forget the yeah. name of the lady. Susan Lasseter Lyons. It's a great book. Lasseter One of my favorites, Lyons. yeah. And, you know, she just talks about not being Superman. Like, don't, don't hide your identity as a real estate investor. Talk to people about the fact that you're in real estate. And often I would say do it with no agenda. So, like, this is why I like to do it prior to the deal coming up. Because if you just start talking to people and you have nothing to pitch them, much easier conversation because they're going, oh, he's just trying to figure out if this is a good fit for me or not. And if it is, then they'll come back to me when an opportunity exists and you can say yes or no, right? And if you have 100 people, I mean, if you have 10 people, right, then you have 10 people that you could bring to and say, hey, this is what we're doing. This is the, the cost. This is, you know, give them the, the metrics. and then, But you've already had those precursor conversations to where they are interested. Yep. Uh, so there's one other thing that I talk about a lot. It's using past history and credibility in other things that you've done. So transfer that trust from, like for me, it would be managing, like when I was a test pilot for the Navy, I'd manage these, you know, $10 million, $50 million, $100 million projects and I'm flying, you know, $20 million airplanes. So, you know, transferring that trust of I've been, I perform really well over here, so I have a lot of confidence that I'll do well in real estate. And so... For those people, and, and going to people that you already have some, they know, like, and trust you already, so you have a relationship. Uh, In the beginning, for me, that was a lot of it. It wasn't going out to, like, you know, just a random person that I met. It, but it's talking about my history, my track record, and why why I believe that I'll do well. And just really build confidence in those people. It's a good point, and I think something that people don't think about doing so often, because even when I started from flipping, I was a real estate broker for years, yep. right? And I was finding deals for investors so for them they knew i was finding good deals because other investors are buying them and now i'm just saying now i'm going to buy it myself yep. and they're like oh people trusted you to find that great deal you know how to do that so yeah and i think that's a really good point to find past experiences that you've been successful in so if you're an amazing nurse or you're an amazing doctor or you're you you were, had a w-2 job where you had a lot of success like just take that take that success and then uh and transfer it here Okay, so you've raised a hundred million dollars at this point. So now let's let's move on to like, how do we raise big money? Like somebody who's already been raising money has been, you know, playing around with it. You went from raising, you know, a couple hundred thousand to millions. Um, what are some tips that you have for people that really they're ready to start raising millions of dollars, or you know, twenty, thirty, forty, fifty million dollars? So I think there's a couple ways to do it. One, you can go the institutional route, which is arduous. You have to have um, a lot of T's crossed and I's dotted, and you know they, they like to take in packets to to look at in a certain way, and you need to be able to understand how to pitch institutional money. What do you so, mean by that? Can you like what is institutional money for those? Yeah, so like family offices or private equity firms, like Wall Street type firms. You know, Harvard endowments, Boston University have, has endowments. These these places all place big money into real estate. So how do you crack that code, and how do you get into it? There are other things, right? They're also placing it into... Well, they're placing all kinds yeah, of stuff, right? Uh, startups, right. businesses. Like, there's, there's going to be people to watch this that are not just real estate people. Now, right. we, yeah. we raise the majority of our money for real estate, but the same principles go along to starting a, a business or a startup or raising money for a fund that you might you know, do something else with outside of real estate. But, I mean, private equity fr funds, they, they buy into businesses, right? So whether it's real estate or whether it's just private equity business or... And they have certain metrics that they need to look at to see if it's a investable business. So I mean, there's state pension funds, and they, you know, there's just a lot of institutional, like what we would consider Wall Street money, that's being put out on the street to companies like ours. But to be able to get in the room, you have to have a significant track record. You need to be able to understand how to pitch the board. You need to see how they want to accept their. Uh, applications and things like that. So I haven't done that route yet. Um, we're probably about 90 days away from being on the Schwab platform to be able to be pitched by registered investment advisors nationwide. So that will be the kind of the first step in that level of credibility. Um, so and why haven't you gone that way? 
I, it, well, so <laughs> just personality-wise, it's annoying, right? Like I, I like to deal with one, the individual investor who, who's trying to build generational wealth for their family that probably doesn't have access to these types of deals. Yep. I mean, for, for me, the Harvard Endowment has access to the deals that I do all the time. You know, um, Mary from church probably doesn't. Yep. So I like the idea of get, getting accredited and non-accredited investors into these deals. Now, it's more work, right, because they're smaller check sizes. So, you know, it, it's trying to figure out what that balance is. Can I get big check sizes from business owners that have too much money that need tax write-offs that can write a million dollar check versus the $50,000 non-accredited investor that's you know looking to get into their first real estate deals? Uh, so going now to these uh, private folks, like where do you find them? How do you uh, how do you get bigger money? Like, what's where should people focus when they're trying to scale that money raising versus oh. just you know onesie twosies? Like like anything else in business, right? You have to start with your core values. You have to understand who you are as a business and what type of partners you want to look for. So core value alignment is always a big deal. You know, our tagline is investing with purpose. We have a, a really big focus on giving back through the business. So we have a, a very large contingent. It's not maybe it's seventy percent. Of, uh, of faith-driven entrepreneurs at this point, faith-driven investors that invest with us that are, that are aligning with the fact that we like to give back through the business, right? So I think, one, creating your core values and just kind of understanding who you are as a person and what you're looking for. I think the biggest mistake that I made when I first started raising capital was I wanted to be all things to all people. I thought that everybody that had money should give it to me. That's, that's a short-sighted and... Um, potentially catastrophic way to look at things, right? There's there's riches in the niches. So understanding who you are and what your purpose is in your business and then finding your tribe, right? Seth Godin has that great book, Purple Cow, Find Your Tribe, things like that. And for us, same thing. Like, how are we creating messaging, whether it's through Facebook, social media posts, whether I'm starting a podcast, whether I have a YouTube channel, or whether I just go to a dinner party and I know how to quickly elaborate on what it is that I'm doing. Not the vehicle necessarily, but the why. Like, what are we actually accomplishing in this world, on this earth, while we're doing this business? And you start to find the right people that are going, hey, that sounds really interesting. I might want to partner with you on something like that. Yep. I think that's the best piece of advice that, that we could give on this to people who are really trying to raise big money is, like, right now, I'm raising money for apartment deals, but it's, like, very part, part-time. Right. And so it's harder for me and a struggle when I get there to raise eight million, ten million because it's not something I have to turn the machine on again. And you know, right, right now we have sixty days to raise twenty two million bucks, which you know, if we didn't focus for the last four years on doing that, there's no chance we would be able to do it. So so how do you do something like that? You have a network right now, you have people that are in the network that will likely invest, but there's going to be new money that has to come in. So where are you money. going? Yeah. How are you driving those leads and traffic? Like, what is the, because there's people, like, I think that's great advice of yeah. how you're going to attack that over the next, you know, two months. Well, so now we have a cadence of kind of how we bring clients into the ecosystem and then how do we nurture those clients. And they've been getting nurtured for, for months and months, right? So we have kind of a free course that you can get when you log in to um, our website, you join the Quote Investor Club. and then we uh, What is it? What's the website? It's uh, investingwithpurpose.org. Okay. And you join the Investor Club. You can see a lot of the nonprofits that we support on the website. and It's, it's pretty cool to see uh, the impact that the business has had. But then we basically give you a free commercial education course, right, with a bunch of content that it's self-paced. So if you're ready, you can raise your hand now and say, hey, I'm ready to, to invest. Otherwise, we're trying to educate the investor because uh, the, best edu the best investors are educated investors. You know, so we, we've been nurturing those clients, right, a couple thousand people over the last couple of years. And when they're ready, when we have a deal, now they're starting to see that when we have a deal, it fills up very quickly and there's not a lot of time to say yes or no, but they're ready now. Um, so there's the nurture part of it, right? And that takes time and that, that creates the credibility where they're seeing you out there, they're seeing you close deals. FOMO, I think, is the best sales, um, not tactic, but the re actually the best like sales uh, education for the investor is because they're thinking about it, they're thinking about it, then they miss out on it, and they see kind of how it's going, and they're like, ah, maybe I should have gotten in on that deal. We go and educate them about, you know, how do we align our investments with our worldview, right? Are your, um, 
uh, are the investments that you're investing in making the impact that you want to create in the world, right? Because I think a lot of people are going, all right, well, let, let me put my head down and go create active income, and then my, my, my investments will create passive income and wealth over time. But more than that, you know, is it aligned with your worldview? Are you investing in things that align with your worldview? And I don't know if a lot of people think about that, but now we have had a really good, you know, big turnout of people. I'm speaking at an event uh, in Dallas with a couple thousand Christian entrepreneurs about this topic. Like, do your investments align with your worldview? Or is it something that you're proud when you get to heaven to say that you invested in? And I don't think a lot of us have really thought about investments in that way. Yes, of course we want a good return on investment, but can we make a positive impact in the world? And are there places where we can do both? And just talking to people about doing that and then being the opportunity to do that for folks has really started to spark this kind of snowball effect of where people are going, yes, I like that. I like what you guys are doing. And this is why we want to be a part of it. So I think we pretty much gave everybody a master class on raising money from the beginning. Uh, just, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars for smaller projects all the way up to bigger people. Where are you finding some of these bigger donors? Like, are you, you're, it sounds like you're speaking at events. Um, would you recommend somebody do some, like, podcasts or some content creation to, to drive people to them? Like, what would be your biggest advice to somebody who's getting started? Or, like, has been raising money but wants to raise for bigger donors? Like, how do you meet new people in the network that way? What's the best place that you've seen success from? If you're going to solve million-dollar problems, you got to get around million-dollar people. Yes. Right. And you have to ask them what their problems are so that you understand what. The, so if you're if you're just starting out, you don't have any big investors. You have to get around them, right? You got to get invited to the party so that you can talk to them and shake the hands and kiss babies. And if you can't get invited, pay for it. Yep. Right. Because that's what I did in the beginning, and now we're getting invited into the rooms instead of you know just paying to be around those folks. But you you start to learn how to solve million-dollar problems. And when you can solve their problems, then obviously there'll be an investor for you. So content creation is absolutely, uh, I think, a big piece of it. And then networking. I mean, you got to get out. And, you know, I have three kids under 10. You have little kids. We're married. We're trying to make sure that we have um, a great home life and a great business life. But at the end of the day, you have to get in front of people. You have to be shaking hands. You have to be on stage. You have to be just around the right people to either give you advice or around the right people that you're trying to solve their problem for. And the more you can do that, the quicker it'll accelerate your success. Okay, let's go to a fire round here. Like, um, let's like quick answers. I got a couple questions for you that I think will be fun. Um, so Steve, what's the most amount of money that you ever made on one deal? $6 million. You made $6 million on one deal. What was it, apartment? It was an apartment complex that we owned for 14 months. 14 months, $6 million. Okay. What is the, what's the most amount of money that you've ever lost on a deal? Um, God, we have not lost money on any deal. You haven't lost money on anything? No house? No not nothing? A flip, not a wholesale. Have you ever put earnest money down on an apartment and had to lose it? No. Oh, my gosh. Okay, what's the least amount of money that you ever made on a deal? Um, we... Twelve hundred dollars on a flip that took nine months. <laughs> That's that is losing money <laughs> if you paid yourself. <laughs> if you paid yourself nine months. That's absolutely okay. True. You lost you lost like thirty grand on that. <laughs> right. and some brain damage. What's the best piece of advice that you would give to somebody who's just getting started in real estate? You know, I think mentorship is is like a no brainer at this point. I feel like when I started, we we started our real estate business and did not get any mentorship for four years. And the maximum number of deals we did in that time frame was 16 deals. The next year, we, we joined a mastermind and got around some people that were way further ahead of us. And we paid for it. Um, and we did 62 deals the next year. So we 5 x our business in one year just by being around people that were doing it better than us. So for me, I think that you know, listening to podcasts is cool, but like getting in the room with people that are doing what you want to do, the amount of money that you need to spend to get in that room is going to be chump change in comparison to how much it's going to cost you learning it on your own. So if somebody was just getting started and wants to become a millionaire as fast as possible, where should they go? I mean, I think real estate is honestly the fastest way to do it. I mean, I think taking active income and putting it into appreciating assets will get you there net worth fastest. 
Do they flip? Should they wholesale or should they go straight to commercial? Depends, right? Like most things in real estate, it depends. Do you have, do you have money now to put into commercial? Go to commercial, right? I mean, the, the Kiyosaki quadrant, right? The cash flow quadrant is like investor is the best. Throw cash into something and let it sit. So it just depends on where you're at financially. What's the fastest way to make active income today if they want to scale their active income? What would you recommend they do if they want to make active income as fast as possible? I mean, you have to become, in my opinion, the best salesperson that you could become. I would study every sales book that I possibly could until I was flawless. Okay, so you would say jump into sales, study sales, and become great in sales. Awesome. Um, all right, so hey, for everybody's watching, how can they find out more about you? Maybe they want to uh, invest with you. I know we shared the, uh, the link to your website. We'll put that in the description. But how can people uh, find out more about you and what you're doing? Yeah, just go on investingwithpurpose.org. Our podcast is Investing With Purpose. Well, hey, thanks for watching. If you guys like what we're doing, subscribe, share it, tell your friends about it.